Hello. <clears throat> Look what I found. Pacific, I put this uh, other stub on. And uh, 10 seconds of browsing around, I found this uh, this cheer di giant diatom that we've been looking for. Look at it. Magnificent. Almost no junk covering it, too. Off to a good start for today's stream. No wobble at all. Very good. Start out with a nice clean picture of this guy right in the middle. I like it. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, good start, right? Uh, what are the structures, the slit-shaped uh, slit areoli? Um, I don't know what they're called, actually. I'm not sure about the terminology for those. Um, this is my lack of familiarity with marine diatoms. Um, they're pretty cool, though. You're right. Uh... Not totally not sure what those are, what the name for them are. Um, I mean, they clearly link to the structure on the inside there in the center. Yeah, Google it. There you go. Maybe Google has an answer for us. <laughs> the eyes of God. Hey, Steve. Uh, this is a stub we didn't get to on. Monday stream, but also from San Francisco Bay, from material that Pacific Plankton sent to me. These are from Tide Station. Um, and uh, I think she sent me these samples because there was a lot of arachnidiscus relative to what we normally see in the samples. And, uh, and we found some in the SEM, so that's nice. Uh, and this is the central part of the arachnidiscus. This is the internal view. So we're looking at the inside of the diatom. And um, in the center, it's got this massive structure uh, in the central area. On the outside of the diatom, there's also sort of a highline middle section. Um, I didn't look around to see if we have any external views, but I feel like the internal views are usually the coolest ones. Um, and then we'll look around and see what we can find. But, uh, you know, two minutes into the stream, we're already taking pictures of the internal view of a arachnidiscus, so I feel like that's a solid start. How's everybody doing? Uh, having a relatively relaxed week, I hope. Things have gotten better for you, I hope, Pacific Plankton, now that you're home. This is sort of interesting. I uh, edited the photos that uh, 
colorized them on, on Monday, the ones that we had collected during the stream. And um, for some reason, the, uh, the more popular photo was not the one I was expecting it to be. But that happens oftentimes. Like what I think is uh, appealing is not necessarily what everybody else thinks is appealing, apparently. So uh, there's already an internal two from before, so this will be internal three. And we can zoom out and get the whole wagon wheel. So as I mentioned on Monday's stream, this diatom is named Arachnodiscus, uh, the genus, the species I don't actually know. Um, and the name comes from the uh, spider web appearance of the inside of the diatom. Um, these costi, these heavy pieces of silica that come out from the center like radiating spokes, and then the crossing structures um, make it look a little bit like a spider web. So, pretty incredible looking diatom. Basically flat, um, you know, not a lot of structure with respect to um, the first order topography of the valve structure. But um, you can see that the inside is actually very intricate. And I think this is going to look pretty good. Um, I might lower the beam intensity a little and see if that helps with making those areoli sort of stand out a little bit better when we, when I've finished with it. I think it will. And I'm going to take that picture. Here we go. Two pictures down. Um, <laughs> Oreos. Uh, that's a good start. Um, I Vag, hello, from Switzerland. And Ru Rutu, hello. Uh, I'm glad you got Oreos, Jane. That's a that's a good start. My daughter and I have a disagreement about Oreos. She seems to think that the cream is the best part, and I think the cookie is the best part. Like I could scrape the cream out of an Oreo and not eat it, and just eat the cookie part and be totally happy. And she could just eat the cream part and leave the cookie behind and be totally happy. So we get along really great when it comes to eating the Oreos, except for I really don't like eating cookies very much. Like, not processed cookies, but homemade cookies I do like. But, uh, you know, she can have that part that I don't like, and I can have the part she doesn't like, so that works out well. <laughs> How many of these do I need to filter a pond? Billions. Um... Uh, you know, if you wanted to filter using diatoms, you need a lot of them, basically. Uh, they probably don't use these particular diatoms for, um, for pond filters, but they do use diatomaceous earth as a pond filter and a beer filter and wine filters and, uh, you know, just plain water filters, basically, because they have a lot of surface area. So, hey, Nid. Hey, Del. Look at this. We got the Dell, we got the Nid, we got the Pack, got all my three uh, three letter uh, exclamation point streamers are here. Yeah, this one's a good one. Uh, that's an arachnidiscus, internal view. Uh, they don't use the live diatoms. The diatomites and diatomaceous earth, uh, those components are usually millions of years dead. So just fossil, yeah. <laughs> the girdle band that's just sticking up here on the top. You like that, uh, <clears throat> this uh, piece right here that's just kind of like butting in. How do you feel about these two pieces of dirt that are on it? <laughs> if, if, if these things weren't there, it'd be perfect. Um, well, I guess there's some down here too. But it's pretty good even as it is. It's a pretty good diatom. <laughs> the geometry, oh yeah. You wish you had a sample full of these. So do I. Um, my sample only has a few of them, but uh, you could make them into some intricate patterns for us, couldn't you, Nid? 
uh, with the pig eyelashes or whatever you're using to arrange them. Um, they're big enough you could pick them up easily, so there's that. Uh, that's one advantage, I think. Um, they're really large, so that's 154 microns across. Um, I think it's bigger than any centric diatoms that I see in freshwater systems, um, at least regularly. I see some that get up in the hundreds, but not usually 150. That's kind of crazy size. Um, and it looks a little bit more like a spider web from out here, actually, than it does when you're in close, which is why it sort of got the name. From a light microscope um, perspective, people probably thought they looked much more like a, a spider web than a, a wagon wheel, which is what I think they look like. Um, they should have been called... Oh, here's another one. There's an internal view of another one right here. It's broken, but it should have been called a uh, Conestoga discus, maybe. That's what I would have called them. Uh, here's another same uh, diatom species, but that one's cracked. There's a Cosina discus from the outside. Let's see if we can find an external view of one of these. And then I kind of want to look around at some of the smaller stuff because we've been focusing on these giant centrics for the last uh, stream and a half here. And it might be useful to actually see some of the little things that are in these samples just so that uh, we can kind of track them and, uh, and see what's in the water. A lot of the uh, dazzling large diatoms like these are you know, they, they sort of catch your eye when you're looking in the samples, but um, sometimes the little ones also have some really cool sort of intricate structure to them. So I'm just going to kind of go around the outside edge and work our way in towards the center. Here's one of these uh, plagiotropus. There's another one up there. We can zoom in on those two. Really didn't get a close look at any of them on... Uh, on the stream on on Monday. It's another discus. There's a piece of something looks like maybe a pinularia right there. There's a plagia plagiotropus right here. So that's a raphid diatom and the raphi runs right up this thing along the outside edge. But that's actually the middle of the diatom. It's actually that um, an axial raphi. It's not it's not on the edge of the, it's not a circumfer circumferential raphe at all. Uh, the diatom's foul face is just arched, which is kind of interesting. Um, kind of similar to entomines, um in a lot of ways. So in terms of like the shape. So this is a process sample, by the way. Um, clear what's going on there at all. Um, sometimes from super far out, it's really hard to see any of the structure, so I kind of have to zoom in and out. But um, I'm not seeing any external views yet. If we don't see any, that's okay. We saw a really pretty one on uh, on Monday's stream, and there's probably some on one of the other stubs we can look through as well. While I'm uh, browsing around on the outside edge of this stub, I can't see what's going on in chat, so <laughs> give me a second and I'll come back. Hoping to find something a little faster than this. Uh, the samples are just taken from drops of water and um, dried onto the SEM stubs. And so um, just however the water droplet kind of dries ends up determining what the pattern of diatoms is on the, 
surface of the stub. So this guy again, very common. Actually quite stunning, but we've got a bunch of pictures of those. And we're back to the internal view that we had that we started with. So let's just cut across the middle. I'll find something kind of cool and then we'll stop and take a look at it and then maybe look for some little things in here hiding among the monsters. That's a uh, detillum kind of hanging out here right in the middle. And it, oh, maybe it's not a detillum actually. I'm not sure which one that is. It looks like detillum, but it doesn't have the fringe around the outside edge. So maybe it's a lithodesmia, but we're looking right down on it, which is kind of a cool view. So let's maybe get that image collected. Looking right down on the stem of that tube that comes off of the foul face. I'm just using the mouse to kind of drag it to where I want uh, because the center click thing is kind of hard to do with a triangle <laughs> or rather harder than it should be. Um, perfect. Okay, um, let's see. Really into the style arrangements, yeah. You glass needles, so cool. The dirt looks cleaner up close. <laughs> um, <laughs> smaller are the bees that build the tiny combs. Um, very small. Very, very small. Um, let's see. You pull capillaries on a flame, but it's just a matter of luck. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see how that's done. Maybe you could show us that because um, really we need to get some of those because I have a micro manipulator in my lab, but we need to get some of the little tube things to actually manipulate things. Um, which is what I don't have, and it would be nice to know how that's done. So maybe show us that as well if you're going to showcase uh, arranging diatoms. Um, <laughs> ribbon eating cat. Most of the time they come out so long and then they can't be used. Ah. Do you see a lot of impacts of climate change on your observations? Um, polar bear, I do, but not on these samples that we're looking at right here. Um, we definitely see um, transitions starting basically in lake records uh, about 100 years ago or 150 years ago. We start to see the impact of um, climate change pretty early. Uh, because a lot of the lakes I look at are in alpine areas and alpine settings are a little bit more sensitive than like Indiana lakes um, because they you know rely on the snowpack and the colder temperatures and um, a lot of the organisms are really adapted for those um, cooler climates and so as the temperature starts to rise in lowland areas it actually has a much larger impact on alpine areas 
And so we've seen changes in um, a lot of the systems that I look at, but even lakes like Tanganyika, which is a huge lake system, um, we definitely see evidence of climate change that's affected stratification patterns and the diatoms respond to that and then they're primary food for fish. So um, we see changes in the heat content basically of, um, of Lake Tanganyika, of some of the big lakes in the tropics, driven mostly by what appears to be warmer climates. So um, that's a good question. We definitely see it and it's so common that it's not really big news um, for science. We've been we've known about it for a really long time. So like it's not like you're going to get a nature or science paper out of, look, I've got climate change in my lake. Um, pretty much everybody observes it, and so you know that's where, um, for scientists, it's not a big deal anymore. I mean, it's a big deal. Don't get me wrong, but like you can't really like just have that record and um, and publish a bunch of papers because. Uh, Everybody already knows that's a, an actual occurring phenomena. So, um, gonna do it in the fall. I don't have much time for streaming. I also need to move my other scope to where I live now. Yeah. Um, triangle shaped is Lithmodesmia, I think. Yeah. So Pacific Plankton gave you the uh, the name for that, Jane. Um, Uh, I'm not an expert on diatoms, but is the SEM really needed for it, or wouldn't it be cheaper just to use an optical scope? So um, for actual identification of most diatoms, um, you can do it with a light microscope. But if you wanted to describe new species, or in some cases, um, if you just wanted to uh, confirm the species that you have, Sometimes you do need a scanning electron microscope to do that. So for um, for almost 15 years, uh, more like 18 years, I suspect, after I finished my PhD and started looking at diatoms, I never had an SEM or access regular access to an SEM. And um, and now that I have regular access to them, I actually think that they're more critical than people realize. Um, there's a lot of mistakes that can very easily be made in taxonomy um, if you don't have a, an SEM to take a look at some of the details. And um, I'll explain it as an example. Um, in 2019, I collected some stuff from June Lake um, that I thought was a fossil species, and I was ready to just stick it into this category of things that, um, you know, they're extinct, but it was living in the lake that we found, so that was kind of an interesting idea, um, that we had this fossil thing that everybody thought was dead, but it was actually living, like the coelacanth or something. And then um, when we put it on the SEM, we realized, oh, it's not quite the same as the ancient thing. It's very close. Um, but it actually did have some features that were different. So um, without an SEM, there's no way to tell. You could, not, uh, you could not tell it from the ancient thing without the SEM to look at it. And also if you wanted to look at um, microevolution in diatoms, which is something that I, you know, at least nominally study um, because I'm looking at species that live through millions of years, um, you can actually look at microevolution in the structure of the diatom through time, and uh, you can't do that without an SEM. You need to be able to see the actual ultrastructure, and um, you know, to be able to tell what you're looking at, I think, uh, clearly. So, can you do it without an SEM? Yeah. Is it perfect? Probably not. Um, but I would say that. 98% of the time people don't use an SEM to analyze the diatom records. Um, and so, but they also have a lot of things in their samples that are just labeled like navicula sp2 because they don't know what it is and they can't tell what it is and they don't have an SEM or Good access news, to everyone. one when they're describing it or looking at it. So um, this is actinocyclus, by the way. See these big sort of uh, ear-shaped um, rimoportula that are around the margin. It's a very clear indication that we're looking at actinocyclus. 
And we see this um, relatively frequently on Pacific Plankton Stream. Um, you can see these sort of sectors that the valve face is divided into, and then there's these sort of weird gaps where it didn't fill in all of the, or couldn't fill in all of the pores between them, and so these create little lines or costi that you see going towards the center of the valve. Um, but this thing, together with a, a structure on the inside of the diatom valve, which I think is right here, um, called a pseudonodulus, is uh, the key characteristics, these big rim of portula with the ear shapes and then uh, radiating sectors and uh, a pseudonodulus, which is like a little de weird little depression um, in the valve face. So uh, pretty cool. And I think I'll just go ahead and collect that image while we're here and I got it. It's pretty clean. It's not perfect, but... Okay, um, hopefully that answers your question, Nid. Um, is there going to be a new Corin campaign in Lake Tanganyika? <laughs> That's a, <laughs> a good question, I beg. Um, uh, uh, probably, I don't know. We're, uh, we're still trying to get that funded. So there is the huge $10 million, $20 million grant that they're working on. Yeah, you can see actually really clearly now that's the uh, pseudonodulus right there, that little depression. Um, so I, I can't tell you for certain. Um, hey, Shafard, how's it going? And thank you for giving him a shout out, Pacific. Science pals, Marmot, good to see you. Um, we got a new follow. Thank you for that as well. Um, Let's see. Are you sure the small features are really belonging to different species or maybe they're just interspecific diversity? Yeah, um, well, genetic analysis also has a lot of variability in it. So I don't know that genetic, pe you know, people think of genetic analysis as being like the solution. But, um, you know, like if you had a couple of diatoms, there's genetic variability. Um, and so if you, you can't just use the genes to sort between species. I mean, you can, um, if they're very different from each other, but if they are undergoing little tiny changes, um, you know, can we detect those? Do we know the relationship between the DNA and how it manifests in the phenotype? Probably not. So, um, structural clues are actually beneficial, but... For most diatoms, like the Stephanodiscus that we were looking at, um, it's definitely not genetic diversity. Every diatom that I saw in the sample that I analyzed had no valve face photoportula, and every one of the ancient ones has two valve face photoportula. So, I mean, that's a small change, but it's an important one. And valve face photoportula uh, arrangement and number for Stephanodiscus, which is the genus it was in, were um, they're considered stable features or features that basically we think of as helping us identify that species from the skeleton. So, um, but part of the problem is we don't have any genetic, uh, information from the fossil diatoms. So how would I be able to tell if I had something that was supposed to have died out a hundred thousand years ago, um, how would I be able to compare it with what I have today and say, oh, well, this one's the same as that one because I can't get 100,000-year-old DNA from that diatom easily or at all, probably. Um, and so it creates an issue. Um, Actinocyclus internal. So, you know, there's some benefits to DNA, and I think that there's some things that you can do with it that you, you know, that help us determine the phenotypic expression of things um, that we see, but uh, for fossil diatoms, it's relatively useless. Uh, at least, you know, I mean, within some uh, range, because it's hard to get the DNA information from sediment and then be able to figure out which diatom it belonged to. And, um, you know, especially if you have things that are really closely related, I don't know that the DNA would be all that helpful. They would group together and then you kind of have to figure out from your own 
judgment whether it's one species or two species. So, um, you know, it's it still requires judgment. It's not like you put it into a black box and it spits out the answer to you. Um, if it did, uh, that would be great. But um, I I think there's problems with the way that you know people assume DNA is going to help us with determining species. Um, it's not. It's certainly not that simple. Um, it's like dependent on which things you analyze for DNA and um, and then the variability in the genotype itself may be challenging to work around. So, I mean, those are good questions, but I feel like uh, it's, it's definitely not uh, a silver bullet that's going to solve a problem for us. Um, it's just a tool in one of our many tool sets that we need to learn to use appropriately. So uh, that's how I would characterize it. Um, I wish it was easier. I wish it was like we could just stick it into a machine and then it would tell us, yeah, that's a new species. Uh, <laughs> just it's, it's uh, definitely more challenging than that. see what else we can find. There's all these plagiotropist pieces that are just laying around on here because it's quite common. Um, but you can see how lightly solidified it is as well. In here, still some Stephanopixis. This one's kind of buried in some trash, but uh, present. We saw a bunch of those in some of the samples. Um, I think probably from the month before, or maybe two months before. And, oh, there's a Cirrella. A little tiny Cirrella. It's a cool one. authority a grasshopper okay I'll work on it um, hey seahorse hello um, I don't know that we've ever looked at uh, a grasshopper um, do you know anything about diatoms relationship with fungi no um, I don't know that they have a relationship with fungi, or if they do, I don't know that, I don't know what it is. Um, I mean, it's, a uh, they grow in moist environments, right? So diatoms maybe growing in the soils might have some relationship with them, but, um, uh, like... Do you mean like um, the microscopic fungi in lakes, like chytrids and things like that? Because I don't know anything about those. Um, you're just, you're outside of my realm. Uh, I probably know some people who study chytrids and could answer that question. Um, but I, I don't have any background in it. Um, at least not uh, anything useful. There's another one of these big hairy shouldered. Yeah, see how it has all the hairy shoulders. Those are cool. Um, Odonteloid diatoms. We've seen those before several times. There's another pretty actinocyclus.
back here. I think this is a uh, Ketoceros. It's two pieces of Ketoceros. Um, it's the boundary between two valves or something. See these long things stretching out from the sides. Let's get a picture of it though. see a bunch of little tiny dots on the surface of these we might want to zoom in and take a look at once we've actually gotten this picture. But I think they're just dry or a little areoli. Um, let's see. Thank you for giving Seahorse a shout out. They have a Seahorse command. Uh, it would be cool to see the Rafi of one. I guess maybe you mean the Cerverella? Um, yeah, there's always some fight between geneticists and the old school botanists, but I feel like um, there's a practical ground that's in between um, in between the fighting. Oh, you found a paper on chytrids. Oh, cool. <laughs> you pronounce the G in fungi uh, than most people in Ontario. I guess you mean, oh, you say fun guy. Uh, I say fungi because I always feel like fun guy sounds weird. Um, but I also say algae, so it's good. Yeah, it's a catastrophe, I think. Uh, I think it's Seahorse, but yeah, he found it. Let's see, code saying, just curious, how far can this SEM actually zoom in? This is super cool. Um, right now we're at uh, 20,000 times magnification. So a normal light microscope bottoms out at usually 1,000 times, but uh, it actually sort of bottoms out around 630 times uh, magnification. Um, the SEM's bottom is this one, um, you can see stuff. It's not perfectly clear, but you can still see stuff at 200,000 times. Um, uh, it, for a clear picture on this SEM, um, you know, like industry standard is 100,000 times. So we ought to be able to get a picture, still get a reasonably good picture at 100,000 times magnification. But I've collected stuff that I think is pretty clear at 170,000 times before. Um, it just depends on what you're taking a picture of and how good you are at uh, fine-tuning the stagnation, the wobble, and the column. Uh, how, you know, how clean everything with respect to the image is. So kind of in that range. Um, but really the difference between like 100 and 140,000 is kind of small, like you're just zooming in a little bit. So, um, you know, relative to the 100,000 part. Um, anyway, yeah, some sort of catastrophe. So, um, you know, it's, it does have limitations. Um, and the, the best SEMs in the world, which this one isn't, but this is a nice one, um, can probably get 200,000 times, you know, images that are at 200,000 times and, and still give you a pretty good image. So.
Um, but if you like looking at small things and they're not, uh, you know, they've got a, a skeleton um, <laughs> that's preserves in a vacuum, uh, SEMs are the way to roll for sure. Uh, so that's a detillum over here. This is Catoceros. This is another Catoceros. This is a cyst of a Catoceros, I think, that we've seen before. Um, what's cool about it is that we're looking right into the inside of it. So you can see these things are like tubes that are coming out from the valve face. And we might be able to see that as if it's a structure. I don't know if it's dirt or a structure. It's just dirt, maybe. Pretty, pretty clear on the inside for the cysts usually. So, and then it looks like this is a piece of a skeleton ema right here. It's also in this pile of fish poop. It didn't disaggregate when we processed it, um, but. Uh, see what else we can find if we roll around in here and then I actually have some I have all the other samples that we looked at from Monday as well on here um, so we might go look around in those a little bit uh, would help if I put the beam intensity back where it goes um, this little guy here is another Ketosterus seeing the spines coming off of it not spines, but similar. Another detillum. For the longest time we were looking for like clean pictures of these and we can never find them and here they are all over the place there's a bunch of actinopticus and these ones are really clean and look very cool somewhere around there i guess we probably won't get much sharper than that for an image seeing the little tiny pieces on the surface. Um, let's see if I zoom out. We'll do one just full size central view. This is the external view of Actinopticus. Um, it's looking pretty gorgeous. So that's, uh, yes, like the fallout symbol, like this guy is Actinopticus and this guy is Actinopticus, the two emotes that are in the channel. <laughs> I made them go across my own screen. I think that looks good. So we'll just collect that. It's gonna look good on Instagram or whatever later. a crowd pleaser. You know how I am about cloud, crowd pleasers. Uh, and I think this one, this is a nice intricate external view of it. Um, these little tubes you see sticking out of the ones that had, are at high elevation. If we were looking at the inside of the diatom, they would be the low elevation ones but they are rimaportula, their structure, 
and this is the external expression of those structures. So we usually see the inside of them, they look like ears, um, but they're um, actually the labia processes or the rainbow portula. But look at all the detail on the bow face of these. So I got this thing pretty tight in terms of the focus. Happy with that. Can't do anything about the little bits of junk on it, but I got it in focus real good. So, and it's a big one, uh, a relatively big one anyway. So, that's nice. I got asked to uh, use my diatoms for the cover of a, a book um, relatively recently, and I think they're going to just take a bunch of my SEM images and kind of trim the diatom parts and sort of make it look like they're sitting next to each other when they weren't. But uh, maybe I'll send this one along for them to add to the photos, because that's a nice one. That's really sharp. Very clean image. <laughs> it's a really slow scan. Uh, I have slower scans than this, so. Um, oh, those are the openings of the Rima Portula. Okay, yeah, I knew what you were talking about. That's a good idea. Um, I should make arrangements on a stub and then take picture of it with the SEM. That'd be a good idea. Or you could make arrangements on a stub and then, oh yeah, I guess you have your own SEM. Um, my plan is to just make arrangements of them and then crop them and then, you know, take pictures of an SEM and then make an arrangement of them by putting them together with Photoshop because I don't want to have to break my back arranging tiny things. But, uh, It sounds like a cool idea. Uh, this is uh, actin, actin a cyclic, actin and opticus, actin opticus. External. Oop. Very good. That was a cool little diversion. Let's see what else we can find to take pictures of. This is a, a little piece here of Asterionolopsis. Right, we're just seeing a bit of it. And I saw bits and pieces of it around when I was sort of scrolling around earlier as well. So. This is a Cosinodiscus or Ferratus or whatever it is. Seems like we see that every time. There's that, uh, Oh, there's an internal view that looks like it's really clean as well. Super clean. We might as well just get both views while we're at it. That's nice. Let's see. How this goes. So those little openings that we saw on the other one, those are related to these things on the inside. So we're now looking at the inside of the same diatom we just, not the same diatom, but the same species of diatom that we just saw. Um, and then these are the Rima Portula openings on the inside. They look like this on the outside. They're just that sort of thickened silica tube.
are we looking at fossilized diatoms here? So code saying we're actually looking at some diatoms that, um, well, we see the skeletons, right? So they're not living, but they were collected living. Um, these were collected by Pacific Plankton, who's here in the channel. And um, so, but we're looking at the skeletons of them. So uh, it's the, what remains of the living organism is the fossil. And I have some older stuff here as well. Um, but most of it's just the skeleton. So I was referring to it as fossil in the sense that it's not alive. Um, I guess I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, they make fossils in the title. Just put different things in to attract different kinds of people. I thought maybe people would be interested in seeing tiny fossils of things. Um, in the technical sense, uh, I usually refer to things as fossils when they stop stinking. So if they don't stink anymore, um, if there's no organic material to be eaten, then it's a fossil. Hey, Hannah and Rebecca, how are you doing? Look at this, look at this. Uh, oh, you beat me to it, Pacific Plankton. But what about this one? Huh? There you go. Um, if you like music and you like diatoms, um, there's uh, Hannah and Rebecca, and um, you get a mix of both there, and you can check out her cool video. I should move this up. So it's on the top, and I also should... Maybe move that up so it's on the top. So the kappas are getting buried. Uh, <laughs> you're not that fast. We're looking at some samples that Pacific Plankton sent to me, uh, Hannah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, if you're on a mobile phone, there's usually a huge delay, so um, I'm I'm used to dealing with that because sometimes I watch people's streams on my iPad. So not a big deal. Yeah, we're looking at diatoms. Uh, it's the thing that I look at the most, but not the only thing that we look at on the scanning electron microscope. Um, this one is an actinopticus, and it's uh, the one in the channel that looks like a radiation symbol on the emotes. And this is an internal view, and we just looked at the external view, so I wanted to get a picture of what the inside looks like so people can kind of get a sense of, you know, the whole diatom. They could see both inside and outside. And we got these really cool uh, arachnidiscus that's right here that we were looking at earlier. Um, a super interesting looking diatom. And I'm just kind of going through and taking pictures of fun looking diatoms for today for a little bit. And then we have some, I have some samples also from um, White Sands National Monument that I want to look at. So um, we may take a look at those as well. I put some in the, on the carousel, um, and I'm looking at those for a friend of mine, um, but there's a bunch of really cool stuff in it, so I thought it would be cool to take a look at it as well, so maybe at four o'clock or whenever we lose Pacific Plankton to whatever it is she's going to get busy with, <laughs> we'll switch to those. Um, so we can take a look at some other cool stuff. Look at this little tiny guy. Oh, he's got one little hole in the center. And then a rim of portula and mantophotoportula around the outside edge. I don't know what that is to genus, but that's a cool... Uh, let's see, we're at six. <laughs> we're super zoomed in. <laughs> I'm at 130,000 times, so... Uh, Pardon if it's a little fuzzy. I want to, to try to see if I could get that structure around there. 
It's so small. Um, what did we decide these things were? Like mini discus or something? They're very, it's a very small diatom. I think we saw these and we thought they, I think Anna told us that these were mini discus. And I believe her because she's a, actually studies marine diatoms and that's what these are. So. She studies freshwater ones too, but she knows a lot more about the marine ones than I do. So let's take a picture of it and move on. Cool little guy. Well, pull up a chair. Oh, thank you for the follow. It's one of the ones you see in chains. Can we send you things to put on the scanning electron microscope? People have. Um, you know, if it's an interesting thing, I don't want to see your cat's boogers or, uh, or your boogers for that matter. Uh, as glorious as your boogers may be, uh, I'm not interested in seeing them on the SEM. Uh, what do you have in mind? Uh, a new Enki? Do you have something interesting did i ever look at a bed bug no um i don't have access to bed bugs i don't uh fortunately don't have bed bugs and i don't know where to get any <laughs> um but if i did i would look at them that sounds cool um nobody wants to have those i know i'm not saying people want to have them but i don't even know where i would get one uh and uh, I don't, I don't know how to catch one. So <laughs> yeah, it's good to not have one. Maybe if I had friends who worked in hotel industries or something, they could get us some bed bug samples. But it's a pretty good picture of that thing. Uh, you can definitely see that the center here is. Um, that's a shredded process, and then all of these are shredded processes around the edge. They have four satellite pores, and then uh, the labiate process here is the one that looks like the lips. And then this looks like a piece of something that just landed on the valve face. But you can see that there's some uh, little structures here, which are the areoles uh, that are areoli that are covered um, with sort of something. Um, but you can kind of see they have this like really light grid, grid, hexagonal grid pattern here. Um, that's just barely visible. It's pretty dissolved and it's also fractured, so that's part of the reason why it doesn't look so clean. And there may also be a little bit of, you know, junk on it, parts of it. So, but. Um, Pack asked me to take a picture, so I took a picture. Also, I thought it looked kind of cool, something we don't normally see. And I wanted to focus a little bit on the tiny things because we usually skip over those. So I'm going to just label it uh, mini discus maybe because I don't know. It's small. I think it was five microns across. So I think that's a fair guess. There's a pleuro sigma. And on both sides of it, I believe those are Thalassiosiris. One little hole in the center and then a whole bunch around the outside edge. And one little hole in the center and a whole bunch around the outside edge. And then I think that's actually the Rima Portula over here. Or maybe it's this one. It's a Styrianellopsis.
can see some of these uh, Odentella things with the hairy shoulders over here. I slow that beam down a little bit. You can see this is a Costa Discus. These are the outside views of Delasius Syrahs. And then uh, there's that Odontella thing. Here's a Catoceros. There's a bunch of Catoceros and cysts sort of hidden in here, or they're here, but they're, you know, just not as obvious because we're zoomed way out. There's another little Odontella, some type. All right, let's go to the next slide over, which I think has actually got some of the um, unprocessed material on it um, from the same sample. So we just, I made a few st stubs from the same material. And it looks like a Thalassiosyra. Rodentella, I, I think that's maybe Plagiotropus, the inside view. Actinopticus. Seen a lot of the same things, so. Let's see if there's anything in the sample that had some live stuff on it and see what we can find. Maybe there'll be some things in chains. Oh. You know, I never did zoom in, so that's part of the reason why the picture didn't look quite as clear. That'll help. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to auto-equalize so we can actually see what's going on. So you can see there's a bunch of um, tintinids in here as well. We saw that uh, on the stream on um, on Monday when we were looking through these. This is the sample that we looked through, but we didn't spend a lot of time on it. So I thought I'd sort of come back and revisit it a little bit. And then we can also go tooling around in the... Um, the other samples that we sort of brushed through pretty quickly. So this is a tintinid. They make their skeletons out of things they find. And there's one piece of a diatom and another piece of a diatom that they've stuck into their skeleton. Um, it can be made out of whatever, they, like literally whatever they find. So. Uh, little pieces of sand or silt, uh, diatoms, um, just literally anything they come across. And then a lot of this other stuff on here is just uh, poop or other organisms um, in the material. Here's another tintinid. I was kind of interested in this thing. It looks like we have a side view of a whole fresh jewel, which is cool. I'm not sure which one. It looks like maybe it's a Melisyra. Let's see if I do this, it'll help. We're kind of in a little depression, so I need to brighten it. You can see the whole frustule there, that's kind of cool. So one valve, the other valve, and then they overlap here where the girdle bands are. And then uh, there's something here next to it that's looks like a shrunken raisin. <laughs> that's some organic matter thing. Uh, it's not handling the vacuum very well.
Uh, let's see, I need to also fix that. That'll help. Put some extra light on things. in this mix of stuff and there's so much light coming in uh, because of the background from these other particles. So I either get really dark or I get really over bright. No in between. Let's see about fixing this a little bit. See the valve face pretty clearly for this one. I'm always convinced that somewhere mixed in with these things we'll find some cool dinoflagellates that are just hanging out waiting for me to see them in SEM, but uh, most of the dinoflagellates appear to not make it through to the SEM most of the time. Or if they do, we don't know what they look like um, because they're degraded. There's a tintinid. You can really see the difference between the processed and unprocessed samples when I look at them like this. You can see all this other junk on here is all organic matter. Um, and you can also see it has a pretty big influence on the light distribution in the sample when we're trying to get a picture of it in the SEM. So another reason why we usually would process them. Um, in this case, oh, there's the 4AM. Like we never did get a picture of that 4AM. Doesn't look very great though. I thought I also saw some really large campylate discus in these samples when I looked at them in the light microscope, but I haven't seen that many when we went looking through them in the SEM. And again, it's probably just because I wasn't looking for them. Um, it helps to have sort of a target in mind when you're moving around so you know what to look for. Um, there's a Ketoceros in their life position, which is something that we wouldn't see if we were looking at the process. We just sort of saw them strewn all over the place. Um, but in the, um, in the unprocessed samples, the nice part is you get to see the relationships for the diatoms because they're still in their life positions. So. I think that's nice. Here's another Ketoceros in its life position, living in its colony. Well, dead in its colony now, but it was living in its colony. Another one of these giant things. And a Tintinid. I think last night we saw it on Pacific Plankton stream, she had a Tintinid and it was bouncing a diatom off of the top of its little um, cilia and it just kept bouncing it and bouncing it like it was trying to pull stuff towards its mouth and then it would get hit by the diatom and then stop wiggling its legs because it was responding to being hit by the diatom and then start wiggling its legs when the diatom moved away again it just ended up looking like it was bouncing off of the surface of it which was really funny I don't know how long that went on but it made me laugh. It's 
Sorry, I've also been scrolling around without seeing chat for a bit because it takes me a while to find something that I want to like sort of hone in on. And... I'll get back to chat, I promise. Oh, that looks weird. Just the angle. Oh, there's a giant isthmian. another giant Ismia. I remember for a really long time we hadn't even seen Ismia and now they're sort of reappearing. Still covered with a bunch of junk. Okay, uh, let's see. Find something here, and then I'll pop back to chat for a bit, see whatever I missed, because it was probably a bunch. Just browsing around in sample. There's a lot to see. There's a little tiny diatom right here, and it's stuck <laughs> on the outside of this giant diatom. I really like it when there's like little things stuck on the big things. It gives you a good perspective on like how big, how different they can be. Let's get a picture of this. The last is Syrah. Let's see what happens. What did I miss? Okay. Uh, sorry, I gotta go way back. Way back. Uh, let's see. Um, red bugs. <laughs> don't wash yourself in a couple of months and don't change the sheets. I feel like that would have a different problem. Is it true you can find diatoms in toothpaste? Yes. Uh, it has to be like Tom's toothpaste or one of those natural toothpastes. Toothpastes? Um, but they do use diatoms in toothpaste as well. The diatomite stuff is in toothpaste. Um, right. Uh, okay, we'll try to get an exterior view. Uh, let's see, for whatever it was, I think probably you're talking about the arachnodiscus. Um, let's see. Are your samples wet? Oh, spirochetes? Yeah, if we dry them, we could look at them. Um fix and then dry, but I don't have any way for fixing things. You can't put stuff that's wet in an SEM, uh, in my SEM. You, usually you need to freeze stuff if it's wet, uh, but like actual wet samples won't work. Um, have you ever studied diatoms from Alaska? I've looked at some diatoms from Alaska, but not in the SEM. Um, I have some samples from Tulik Lake in Alaska. Um, 
uh, I tried to write an NS grant, NSF grant for looking at uh, diatoms on Adak Island, but it didn't get uh, selected for funding. And I think we tried twice and then just gave up on it. So, uh, let's see. Now I know how to say frustule. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'll try today with play with rinsing and drying. Okay, it's fine. I want to see if we can induce bacteriophage lytic cycle using RMF. Uh, what is a process sample? Uh, process samples are ones that get boiled in acid, yeah, as Pacific Plankton mentioned. Um, or we use hydrogen peroxide sometimes to boil them, yeah. See, you answered all of my questions. I don't have to do any work around here. It gets rid of all the organic stuff. It turns the carbon into carbon dioxide, basically, by adding extra oxygen. And then, uh, you know, carbon is a solid, carbon dioxide is a gas. So uh, it basically degasses the material. Um... Is he scanning right now or scanned earlier? Yeah, this is live. I'm scanning stuff right now. <laughs> you can ask me things and I will answer them. So I feel like uh, that's got to be live, doesn't it? Is there a way to make it do it another way? Glaciosyra external. Um, I'm, I'm uh, just a, you know, give you an example. I'm, I'm moving to the Tintin now. Uh, I'm responding to the things you've said in chat. Uh, it's, it's all live. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump over to uh, the other sample, one of these other samples here. I think we have one more from process material, or maybe there's two more with process material that we found some of those arachnidiscus external views in because I think Pacific Plankton wants to see it, and I wouldn't mind revisiting it because it was actually really cool to see. I don't remember where it is on the slide. Um, I probably could just go type in the coordinates again, though, if I was being lazy. And that would fix it, but I'd have to go look up the coordinates because I don't think these samples have moved. So but let's just see if we can find it first, and then if we can. I can always go look for it later with you, Pac. I'll just stream it into the Discord channel, and you can take a look at it with me some other time. Uh, oh, look at that. It's a silica flagellate. Not a diatom, but... Uh, there's a diatom right next to it, and underneath it, it's an internal view of the Echnanthes that's in these samples all the time. That would be a cool thing to get an image of. I don't think we've looked at the inside of these before. We usually see them on their side. Actually, looking way inside of these is kind of interesting. something going on in there as well. It's sort of a cool structure on the inside of the valve. Let's uh, slow it down. Fix this so you can see the detail in there. And then fix this so we can get it bright enough for people. But there's actually a really cool intricate little internal structure on the insides of these. Very cool.
So they have costi, and then these are the striae, the individual striae, and then these are the areoli, the little tiny holes. And they have little coverings over the holes, which are quite intricate. And I don't like the way that it looks yet, so let's play around with this. Still too dark. That's better. perfectly in focus. set it to 8 and now we're taking an even slower picture but I think for the detail we gain I kind of want it so just uh, be patient and it'll give me a chance to actually catch up with chat for a little bit let's see because people keep asking questions and I'm always like you know halfway into my sample here um, It's easy to get lost in the SEM. Yeah, I will catch up. Wish you could afford one. I wish I could afford my own. Uh, what can we do with diatoms? Oh, well, people were talking about this earlier, uh, Anu. They were looking at, um, you know, we could use them for, we use them currently for things like beer filters and wine filters, uh, hand warmers, uh, toothpaste. Um, dynamite that's how they're like practical uses um, but people have used them in like medical professions they've used them to deliver cancer treatment to people inside their have a move through their blood basically and they attach something to the diatoms um, but I had somebody tell me that that's not really very practical like they do it but it's not really as as practical as people thought it would be um, <laughs> uh, no, no, we're not reviewing pictures. Uh, the da down below me, down here, there's a slideshow with some colorized images that um, are from old um, streams, but this is actually live. Um, the I don't want to mess up the SEM, but. Um, we're, we're in my SEM lab, and uh, let's see, I can probably show you if I can get my drive cam to work. Oh yeah, it's working. Give me a second. And I'll, while it's taking this big long picture, we can actually look around in the, in the actual room here. Huh? Here we go. We're live. 
that that's the that's you guys talking to me. There's the computer. Here's the actual SEM that we're using. Uh, it's a Tescan Vega 3. And the samples that we've been looking at, uh, they're like these in size. So like the whole thing that we're looking at is basically the tip of my finger for one whole sample. And over there's the sputter coder. This is the actual SEM uh, machine. Here's the headphones I'm connected to. There's the chat that's actually going on. Uh, over there's our calendar. Back here is like a ton of samples that we've either looked at or are going to look at soon. Um, but uh, um, on the actual SEM, uh, this is the secondary detector. It's the thing that's actually collecting the image. And that is the elemental analyzer, which we're not using because diatoms are all made out of silicon dioxide and it's not very interesting so it would just be silica and oxygen and then whatever's on organic material that's on the samples and that's the infrared camera that looks into the SEM and lets me see um, and I think you can see that below us here uh, in when I have it on the regular image and these are ports that aren't being used currently on the SEM so it's that one it's not being used um, but this thing opens like a drawer and there's a, a mount in there um, that the carousels sit on. And then uh, there's some more samples over there, and some more samples back there, and some more back there. This is the lab, basically. So hopefully I've convinced you that we're, we're live. Also, it's taking a while to stream, so uh, this uh, particular image is going to take a while to collect. But uh, I'll give you a little tour. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually talked about this uh, blood diatoms the other day, Hannah. We were talking about um, people using diatoms in forensic science. So like if you choke on water, some of the water gets into your lungs and some of that water has diatoms in it, then the diatoms get into your lungs. And then they go from your lungs uh, into your actual bloodstream. And then they, you know, move around in your circulatory system and end up getting buried in your bones so um there's a <laughs> there's a there's probably diatoms in your bones if you've ever swam in uh any type of water that wasn't a swimming pool so rivers lakes ocean um there's probably some diatoms if you choked on any of that water like aspirated any of it um as it, most people do when they're swimming they get a little bit of water in their nose or mouth eventually um, so I had to put my shoes on for that tour. I didn't get out of my seat, but, uh, I, sometimes I'm sitting here with my sandals off. Um, when I first heard about SEMs, I was naive to think I could buy one on eBay, not knowing all the preparation requirements involved, not to mention the cost. I think, um, NID bought their... Uh, their scanning electron microscope from a university that didn't want it anymore, but it was an old one and they had to fix it up. So <laughs> when you were 16, you wrote a song called Choking on Water and now you can update it. That would be great. Um, I think that would be a delightful uh, song topic for Diatomus, but... Um, I mean, all of your songs can't be diatoms. Uh, but they could all have a little science hidden in them, probably. Um, yeah, so any of that that you've breathed in, that goes in your lungs. Your body takes uh, junk that gets into your, like dust, that gets into your blood, and it buries it in the marrow in your bones. So uh, that's... That's basically what happens to diatoms. And um, they've analyzed some people, their lungs, um, you know, that, that died, they've analyzed their lungs for diatoms, but they uh, sometimes will look for the diatoms in their bloodstream um, or sometimes all the way down into the marrow of their bones, although that's less common, um, to try to see if they can figure out, you know, like what kind of water they actually, if it seems nefarious. 
uh, or if it's like they got murdered, um, they sometimes look and say, oh, these are marine diatoms, but this person was found in a freshwater lake. So they know they got drowned in the ocean and then the body was moved. Um, they use them in that way sometimes. So, <laughs> diatom Easter eggs in your songs. Yeah. <laughs> Well, only like two people know about it or whoever's here in the stream you know our 15 viewers they'll, they'll know but uh, the other people won't have any idea so it'll be good it's a good easter egg totally hidden in plain sight Those of us with an in, yeah. So there's uh, these really cool structures on the insides of this. It doesn't matter which diatom I pick, I feel like there's always something cool. Um, you know, there's always something cool going on in them. This particular view, I think, is really cool. Uh, very three dimensional feeling with the sidewalls of the diatom kind of on the bracketing ends and then the um, rafi kind of sloping down and then all those costi coming in uh, it's very uh, artsy shot that I took here so probably will end up on Instagram we'll see this is Acnanthes an internal view Acnanthes are common diatoms in marine settings, and they used to be, um, it used to be this massive category of uh, genera of diatoms, um, like really massive, uh, like everything was Acnanthes that only had one valve uh, with the raphe basically, and um, and then it got split apart, like you know, eventually. So, cool, cool view of the inside of one of those. I don't think we've ever actually looked at one of those, despite having a bunch of them in the samples. Um, we just didn't get any like good views like this before. So, always something fun. Uh, that's too bright. There's an endless number of things that we could look at in every one of these samples. I feel like it never stops. That's the surface of a Melosyra. Fascinating looking structures on the valve face, these sort of star-shaped spines. They come to really sharp points uh, when I have it in focus. And then, <laughs> like it is now. Uh, and then you can see there's a bunch of little holes in a ring right here around the surface as well. If only we didn't have this junk right here, that'd be a really pretty picture. Um, there's lots of them. Here's an Actinocyclus. These are Thalassiosyra. So that's Tillum on its side. Um, lots of cool stuff. Uh, Sarah. Some Kitosaurus laying around in our field of view. diatom. There's 
just a bit of the surface structure. You can see this is the way they're supposed to look and the holes have all been broken out on these ones. I think it's costing a discus. Here's another internal view of Arachnodiscus. We'll go back and look at that in a second. I think we imaged this one, and maybe even a close-up of this one. But the pores are extremely intricate. They're divided into these two halves each one with their own sort of pore covering structures and sometimes there's no division at all but they have like really intricate internal components to them. Computer is having a hard time figuring out how to auto equalize these. Probably because there's a, a lot of bright and dark spots all together in the same image. Seven, six. Just go ahead and collect this. While we're here, um, people in the other room. Uh, let's see. Oh, the guides, yeah. Um, that site is the Diatoms of North America, which is um, also house, houses the glossary. Um, and a lot of the diatoms we're looking at uh, aren't in the Diatoms of North America website right now because it focuses mostly on freshwater diatoms. And these are marine that we're looking at. So um, some of the genera that we have, that we see, we can actually have. You're watching on your desktop now, yeah. Probably best to be watched on a big screen. A little screen, maybe it's a bit too much detail to clearly see. But um, I suppose I could move that uh, image collection. Oh, it is all the way over. Yeah. Some people in the other room chatting. <laughs> I may need to close the door. I'm not sure what they're talking about. Alright. 
So a nice clean view, this is the internal view of an arachnidiscus. Now I've got a bunch of really cool images of arachnidiscus, which is nice. It's weird how much of that noise doesn't get blocked out because it's like low tones. So my headphones are noise canceling, but it, like the bass sound of their voice comes through, but you can't really hear it because of the buzz of the pump. Uh, Arachnus to internal. Very cool. Let's see what else we can find. And then I probably need to jump over to the um, the samples from White Sands, if we're going to look at them soon. <laughs> um, but I still have some stuff I want to look through in the Mountain Lake samples as well. So it's just, uh, once you start looking at stuff in the SEM, there's an endless list of things to get through. And challenging to see everything for sure you can see the middle part of the sample with all the diatoms are kind of clumped together um, to the point where we really can't even be challenged to get any of those without having hundreds of other things <laughs> also visible this looks like the mellow syrah that I wanted <laughs> let's stop and take a look at it <laughs> this one with no junk just like I asked. I guess I just had to ask nicely. Good. Let's fix this. Get the highest resolution possible. And we'll collect that. That's a Melisira valve face view of a Melisira. One hour and 47 minutes, yeah. Um, the bits are called Vola, yeah. It depends on whether they're attached to the edge or run through a, a, a thing in the center. The, um, the poor occlusions have a bunch of different names. So, You want to see the white sands? Okay. I'm going to close that door because I can still hear them. Even with my headphones on. So. There's a Mercury, Mercury analyzer in the next lab over, and uh, some students are using it. This diatom looks like there was an explosion in the middle. And then... Super spiky, right? I love that view, though. Very cool. I 
got uh, followers here. Sovereigny. Sovereigny. Uh, Nuenki and Code Sane uh, from today. Just want to say thank you guys for following. Acknowledging your follows. Now you'll be able to tell when I stream. Uh, normally from the SEM, it's Mondays and Wednesdays in the afternoons and Eastern time, usually starting around 2. And from the light microscope, who knows, whenever I feel like it. And from my camera, whenever there's an opportunity. Um, supposed to be storms every day this week uh, here, but that was just a total lie. So the storm that was supposed to happen today didn't happen, obviously. Uh, it's sunny, and it says that there'll be a storms all day tomorrow, but that's what it said yesterday about today. So don't trust the weather. It's a good one, isn't it, Nid? It's enchanting. Entrancing. All the good uh, feels from that one. Cyra Bell face. I've gotten so much better about identifying uh, marine diatoms. I almost feel like I can do most of it. <laughs> Which is, you know, good considering a year ago I couldn't identify any of these. I would be like, here's a round one, here's another round one. This one's probably Thalassia Syrah. Um, what's this? Oh, it's a long skinny one. It's just filled with junk, so we can't tell what it is. Um, but I will say that compared to most freshwater diatomists, I probably am pretty good at marine diatoms now. I mean, just the ones that I see in San Francisco <laughs> Bay, unfortunately. But, uh, I'm not doing too bad. Let's see, what's this little teeny guy? It's another one of those little... It is. And it's in better shape than the other one was. And we're a lot closer, so I can get it in focus again for you this time, Pacific. I hope. Oh, right at the edge. Oh, but we're on beam intensity 10. All right, let's see what we can do with this. There we go. There is a perfect focus for this. It's right there. Let's see if the stigmation needs to be tweaked at all. It's pretty good. I don't know that we'll do much better than that. So. We're gonna mini discus take two. Uh, yes. You can see a lot more of the detail on the valve surface on this one. And the little tiny coverings over the satellite pores are visible now. What's up, nerds? How's it going, Dr. Derp? Sam Shung, would I like more saltwater samples? I mean, I'll take them. Uh, my lab tech keeps asking me, like, why do we have all these marine stuff if I don't do marine diatoms? And I'm like, how am I going to learn them if I don't? Uh, it's always, if it's got diatoms in it, I probably want to see it. It's just how it is, unless it's full of Nitsia, and then I probably don't want to see it. 
this, uh, how much better would this diatom look if, if it had a mustache, though? I feel like the mustache would improve it. Oh, I can't move the mustache around. Oh, here, that's why. There we go. We'll put the little mustache on it. Or a big mustache on it. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Uh, most of the round diatoms, they look better with a mustache, right? <laughs> You're just going to go ahead and pay out the mustache points. I think you, you well, must have, uh, given us a mustachio last, like, two streams ago, and I didn't put it on anything. There you go. Now it's got a mustache. I feel like that's appropriately sized, too. It's perfect. Thank you for the follow, Peter Hexen. Thank you for a uh, compliment. We're looking at some diatoms from right now from San Francisco Bay. Oops, its nose is moving. Well, we'll just let it move for now. Can I provide some Vancouver, but I suspect it would be the same variety as Pacific Plankton. Maybe or maybe not. Um, I could provide one from the Dead Sea, but I doubt anything is alive in that. Well, I don't need it to be alive. I'm going to kill it anyways. But there are diatoms that live in the Dead Sea. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, um, Hannah, uh, works in the Dead Sea on diatoms. So there's definitely diatoms present in it. I wonder if we... Uh, This one down here looks like also a little one eye with a mouth. Just one eye though. Or maybe two eyes if it's these ones in the sideways mouth. Uh, yeah, her name, well, her, uh, I think her science name is still Hannah Vossel, but maybe not. But uh, she's been on the stream before, uh, way back when we first started. And I don't think she's been on here since, but she also is in Germany. So it's a challenge for her to meet up with our um, the time, you know, that we're on. So, I think she works during the day, and then it's a mini discus, maybe two. But I could ask her to come back and talk about it if you'd like. I think she's working on her samples from there now, or was. She probably would make time. There's a whole bunch of these little holes in this one. Oh, this is, uh, you can see the, um, the Kerbera on these as well. We're super zoomed in. Uh, well, this is 40,000 times, so, I mean, I guess we could get closer. But you can see the crib on these are, they're not uh, little round things, they're sort of random shapes, or pseudo random shapes. This is a pretty cool view. Yeah, I've done pictures like these from this group before. But you can, I actually just wanted to sort of showcase the strutted processes that we were looking at. So there's a central hole and there's a bunch of little holes with pore covers over top of them. And that's a uh, strutted process. That's what it looks like right there. This one has five, that one has four. And then these are Kerbera. They're the sort of like a covering, like a sieve plate that covers over top of the areoli. And I believe that's the last Syrah. Here's the room of Portula. And I think that's strutted processes all over the valve. But uh, maybe it got moved. Almost four, so I feel like we should go to the white sand sample soon. And then I still have some mountain lake stuff I haven't looked at that I really want to look closely at. But uh, moving it to the back burner, and we'll look at it next week maybe. Along with samples from my mom's pond, which I might look at tomorrow in a separate non-streamed SEM time. Or I might try to look at next week on the actual 
because I do want to stream it so my mom can see it. Um, she doesn't watch them live, but uh, it was cute. Last night she wanted me to call her so I could tell her. She's like, there's a thing when I start the link and it starts counting down. Am I doing the right thing? Because uh, I have that like starting screen when I do the SEM. And she didn't know what it was. And then uh, she thought maybe she screwed something up. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it's fine. trying to explain to her, like, you know, I want to let people have a chance to get into the channel before I start streaming. Okay, well, um, probably tomorrow afternoon I'll do a little bit of a stream into the Discord from uh, some of this stuff. So if you're around then, Pack, you can check it out. And uh, if not, I'll just take some more pictures uh, and I'll probably get some from the uh, the Mountain Lake stuff. I'm particularly interested in looking at some of those Rikosphenia and... Hello, what are you? Oh, it's an internal view of the Melisira, I think. Um, just sort of poking around at stuff in there that I'm kind of interested in seeing and documenting so that we have it. Um, I found some other cool stuff in the samples yesterday. I was doing a little bit of um, snooping around in Jackson Lake stuff and I found a, uh, a really cool companies that I think I need to have a picture of, but I didn't have any external views, so I probably need to make some more of those, and, you know, I'm going to do some more SEM stuff, um, but probably won't stream most of it, so, but maybe to the Discord. So if you're interested in catching it, you can always just uh, join our Discord, and then sometime tomorrow afternoon, just look out for the stream icon to show up. So I'll probably be in there doing that. Um, but for now, let's jump over and look at the white sand samples. These are samples that my friend Nicole sent me. And really, I only know Nicole through Twitter, but um, we've been Twitter friends for a long time. And then um, I worked on some crypto organic, crypto organic soil SEM images for her um, last December, January. Um, and so I have some... Uh, she wanted me to take some images of diatoms as well, so I have some of those. I think the best ones are on six, so let's start there. And um, the samples are full of diatoms. These were collected from a spring in, um, in White Sands National Park. And you can see how little they are compared to the marine diatoms, so there are some long skinny things in here. I think those are all Nitsia. And uh, I made a couple of stubs of these, but uh, I'm just kind of browsing around at things. Don't really have a agenda, except for to take some cool pictures for her of the diatoms that are present. And we're trying to catalog what's there. So some of them may be new species or they may be existing species that haven't been reported from North America or things like that. So um, we'll see what we can find. But they're all much smaller than the marine stuff so we're going to have to zoom in quite a bit. Um, we saw one of these I think from the mountain lake sample, something very similar to it. It's a Diplonese. Um, it's not in focus yet, give me a second. a little bit different than what I was expecting to see, but it is the right diatom. Ooh, that's cool. Preservation's nice and they're nice and clean. These are gonna be fun. So there's some little tiny pores on these with little tiny pore covers. Right here.
Uh, this is the Rafi. And um, these are in the genus Diplonese. It's a diatom. And they're sort of peanut shaped. They have a contraction in the middle here, make them sort of hourglass or peanut shaped. I'm just going to spin this one around. So we need to go like maybe 30 degrees. That was a good guess. And I need to get that back into focus because spinning it sometimes takes it out of focus a little. Nice and sharp. So I think this is a, uh, a diplonese that's most commonly found in marine settings. And the reason I think that is because most of the marine diplonese are peanut shaped like this, or more of them are peanut shaped like this than the ones that are in freshwater settings. And um, so it's probably like the samples are from White Sands National Park National Monument, which has uh, it's it's a spring-fed um, a little spring pool or something where she collected them, and um, it's probably got a lot of um, dissolved salts in the water. Whether it's actually like you know marine salts or whether it's just a uh, high concentration of calcium and things like that. Um, but it, it's probably really elevated alkalinity. So um, that sometimes will substitute for actual salts for some diatoms. Um, or it may actually be kind of salty. Uh, the samples do undergo evaporation, and there's some evaporites. And in fact, some of these samples had uh, gypsum crystals in it when I made them for the light microscope to look at them. So it's a cool looking diatom. And we're going to capture its picture right now. And then we'll hopefully find some internal views of this thing as well. Oh, I'm so far behind. Okay. Del's back. Uh, hello, Del. Um, are there any differences in diatoms based on elevation? Sort of, yes. Um, because temperature is a primary control and also UV can be a uh, discriminator in some environments. And also um, there's kind of a depth uh, elevation relationship with many lakes. So um, there is some elevational difference, but it's probably not, uh, you know, it's probably not like air pressure. Uh, it's probably other things that are related, so. Back from Megalurk. Uh, you went to the DMV and you got your real ID done. Okay. Uh, your old ID had been expired for three weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Crypto organic soils, yeah. Uh, they, they had like lichens and uh, other things living in the top of the soils, and we wanted to look at the lichen. Um, she studies those, so uh, I didn't share any of that stream or those pictures um, because I didn't know if they were going to be something she might want to have for publication. So, um, but these ones, you know. This could be anything where I found these samples. It's just got diatoms in it. Uh, let's see. Crisp green spring. Hey, Bit, how's it going? What are the nodules? Uh, I'm not sure which ones you mean. You mean like these ones around the outside? 
They may just be silica depositions, or, or you mean on the surface. Those are definitely silica depositional. Uh, they're called granules. It's the same thing as on that little navicula that I posted a picture of yesterday in the Instagram. Um, it's like when there's extra silica, the diatoms will store it um, by depositing it on their valve structure. I don't know why, um, but they'll sometimes just stash extra silica on there. I guess they're hoarding it. Um, for their uh, potential dissolution of stuff later or something. I don't know. But it's usually just like a sign that there's a bunch of extra silica. Uh, a granule, yeah. Uh, let's see. Can you make those into a butter? I don't think so. What a figure, exactly. We get a little diatom pillows. Um, well, you could make us pillows if you'd like, Pacific. I don't know how to make pillows. So uh, this has got to go in a new folder. This is WHS, White Sands. Sexy diatom with an hourglass figure. Uh, what else do we got in these samples? There's a lot of really cool looking stuff in here when I looked at it in the light microscope. another diatom. I think it's actually another Diplonese, a different species of Diplonese, this one. And then there's this one. Let's see if we roll around. There was some really cool, um, yeah, Mastogloia. So this is a Mastogloia here. Let's see if we can find a whole one. It's just a fragment. But there were some really cool mastogloia when I was looking around in the light microscope that I was really kind of excited to see. There's a girdle band of a diatom with the diatom missing. There's a broken fragment of diplonese. Not sure what this is. Hopefully we'll see that. It's a nitsia. This is another nitsia. So there's a whole bunch of nitsia. There's an internal view of a Nitsia. Let's zoom in and look at it. Sometimes they're really kind of pretty looking in the SEM. So these little holes are fibula. That one's not hideous. Here's an internal view of that uh, hourglass looking diatom. That's what I really want to see is a nice internal view. Here's one. There's a whole bunch of them. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Let's look at this one. <laughs> uh, this is the other Diplonese. That's a Diplonese. Get the proximal raphe end nice and sharply in focus, and then the rest of the diatom will hopefully also be mostly in focus. to go back a little. If there was a uh, a game about guess how many degrees I need to turn the SEM in order to get this thing to be in a diagonal direction, I think I would probably be winning whatever it was because I'm pretty good at guessing that. It's off by two degrees from perfection. Let's double check the... So I don't know what the species is for this. I don't know that I've ever seen a 
diplonese that looks like this before. And so a lot of the stuff that we're seeing, because I don't really look at like hyperalkaline or saline terrestrial environments very frequently, so it's all kind of new stuff to me. Um, I know it's a diplonese. If it's in freshwater diatom, I'll probably get the genus correct, but I will need to compare it against something to figure out like what it is. Um, to species and having the SEM images will be great because we're trying to catalog like all the different diatoms that are present in the site. So I won't get all that done today, obviously, in the next hour. That's a lot to ask, but I can at least start on some of the ones that I think are interesting and unknown to me. Like this particular diplonese It's pretty interesting. The terminal ends of the raphe, they just kind of stop comes up and it just stops. Not even really like a clear glossa. So we will collect that. Hey Whisker Ant, how are you doing? It is SEM time. Uh, merch ideas. Well, I have some merch. Uh, I have a, a Redbubble site and you can buy pillows with diatoms on them, but they're shaped the way that the company made pillows, which is square. So. <laughs> Peanut atom, exactly. Uh, do you consider diatoms as plants or animals? They are neither. They are uh, stromenopiles, which is like something not like a plant or an animal. Um, people like to call them protease, but I don't like the term protease because protease just means it's small and it's not a plant or an animal. <laughs> it's, it's not helpful. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's better just to say algae, but even algae is kind of a garbage term. I mean, things that are considered algae are really different from some other things that are considered algae. So even algae is kind of like a meaningless term. But uh, when you say stromenopile, then people are like, what's a stromenopile? And then you have to explain, well, it's this thing that has three little hairs, but in diatoms, the hairs are basically no longer present. And then, you know, it's like complicated uh they're not plants or animals though uh they're microscopic algae with a silica cell wall um but not a plant so plants usually have like a vascular structure and they're usually more than one cell so hard to say Oh, I see, the peanut, the peanut butter. I got it. Now I get it. Diatom mold shape for cookies would be a great idea. Um, and I probably would buy those and sell those at the diatom, uh, the diatom meetings. People would buy them so they could make diatom cookies. Uh, I don't know how to bend wire, you know, cookie cutter things into shapes. I saw that they do that by like, I watched one of these like how things are made. They have like machines that kind of like crunch it into the shapes. But I don't, I don't have one of those machines. So, uh, Sylvia knows a lot about Mastogloia. Yeah, Sylvia is a Mastogloia expert. Um, and I thought maybe I would take some of these pictures and then share them with her and see if she knew what they were. Master from the Greek nipple. Nipple glue. Great. Just getting the genus is cool. Well, that's what I do. It's easy to get things to genus for me. Uh, that's step one is the easy step for me. These are WHS. Um, for me, anyway. This is... I'm just going to call it Diplonese Oval because it's an oval. We'll figure it out later when I get uh, some more views of it and maybe some measurements. Let's see, this should be on 10. This should be on four. And then I can actually see things and move. Um, I think that's an external view of that diplonese and here's an internal view of the uh, hourglass diplonese, but it's got junk on it. So we're gonna find another one that doesn't have junk on it. 
Here's another external view. Here's another internal view, but it's got junk on it. Um, that's a Mastocloia right there. There's another Diplonese. There's lots of uh, diatoms on the slide, so like I feel like I can be picky about getting a good view of something. I'm sure that we'll find other views of whatever diatom we find so that we can characterize it better. Um, there was these, uh, oh, there's Ropelodia. There's a bunch of really tiny things in here too. Um, these are epithemia. This thing here is an epithemia. There's an epithemia, they're slightly dissolved. This one is missing all of the outside structure of the pores. There's a Mastogloia without any of this stuff, but it's got a rock right in front of it. Lots of epithemia. There's another nice internal view of the Diplonese. It's a nice internal view of our epithemia. Lots and lots of diatoms just all over in the sample. Diplonese again. This is a really long, skinny one. I don't think it's the same as the one that we saw before. Do something like this. Like this. You can zoom out. to go maybe uh, like that. So the um, external view of these is not very exciting. There are little tiny pores if we zoom in. These are the, uh, right here are the areoli, these little guys. And those pores are just barely visible with these little tiny structures. Barely visible, but visible. Six. I think we can actually even still see those pores, even as tiny as they are. Oh, Hannah's back. Hello, Hannah. Uh, let's see. 
prokaryotes need to make grilled cheese somehow too. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, that's my Redbubble site if you're interested in buying stuff with diatoms on it or water bears or whatever. I did some drawings and took some pictures. Um, let's see, the irony is that taxonomy is supposed to make things more simple. Yeah, it doesn't. Things are complicated no matter what. They're pretty in the LM. Yeah, that's true. I like Diplonese. Uh, we're working on describing a bunch of species of Diplonese as well. You have some new stuff you can add to your song now, Hannah. We talked about some other diatoms for you. You can tell me what you think they look like in your song as well. Whenever, uh, whenever Hannah sings the song now, we spam her channel with a bunch of uh, diatom emotes. <laughs> you wrote some down, okay. Good. I'm waiting for that song to expand. Also, I had some really cool ideas for songs for you, but uh, I wanted to give you a break because it was like there's just a pile of people making recommendations for songs. It's Acnanthes. Uh, I don't know if they're Uniseriate. We can take a look at it, but I doubt it. They're probably Biseriate. There's probably a little offset. Yeah, Acnanthes. They have one valve with a raphe and one valve without. Acnanthes, exactly. Well, you know, you got your own agenda. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to play everything everybody requests. But, uh, I was like, oh, what about this song? And I was like, eh, I'll just wait. There'll be time. All right. Diplonese captured. This one is uh, even more elliptical than the other one, so I'm going to call it elliptical. The other one was more oval. Let's see what else we got in our sample. This should be 4, this should be 10. And we can see things and move around at the same time. Here's another one of those diplonies. They're all over the place. Um, Is it a cockanese? It is. It's got, also got little granules on the surface for uh, for uh, for Dell. Maybe seventy. Farther. Or does it? That's pretty good. Let's see what these look like up close. There's a little tiny sort of slits in the port covers right there. can see. see the little tiny slits in the pore covers. There's one, just one in this one. There's two in these ones. I don't know if those are actual like openings or what those are. But they're in focus, which is the important part because I'm going to take its picture. Smile for the camera. Seven. 
This one, I think, is, uh, well, this genus is Cochineus, or Cochineus, sometimes people say. Uh, they live on plants, and they have one valve that looks like this, and it's sort of cup-shaped, and then they have another one that sits on the inside that has the raphe on it that they attach to the plant with. So this is the non-attaching side, or the non raphe side, and really common grow on surfaces, particularly on like plant surfaces, but sometimes other diatoms. And we see them sometimes in Pacific Plankton Stream attached, or her samples attached to other diatoms in the marine realm. That's pretty common. It's like a diatom that lives on other diatoms. Um, epiphytic for the most part. So. <laughs> okay, you put Twin Falls back on. Any Built to Spill songs feel like they should be on the active list at all times, but that's me. Uh, the diatoms are very photogenic, yes. How can I tell if they're smiling? Well, they look happy. Doesn't it look like a happy little diatom? What is that Bob Ross with a kiss face? What has he got on his face? Um, could life have appeared on Earth without diatoms? Well, life did appear on Earth without diatoms. Uh, diatoms definitely weren't the first things on Earth. Um, is it epiphytic if it's not a plant? If it's an algae, I think it still counts. Uh, phyto means things that have chloroplasts. So they don't necessarily have to be plants. I know there would be almost no life in general without phytoplankton. Yeah, uh, there would be very little. But, um, you know, uh, cyanobacteria came before diatoms by a long shot, by probably a billion years, so, or more. So, yeah, there'd be life. No blue, no green. What a pretty diatom. Probably Cochinese pediculus, but maybe it's lineata. I don't know. The texture's nice, yeah. There's a lot going on. And I do a lot of like, uh, imaging diatoms for the uh, aesthetic. <laughs> you like how round they are. Well, some of them aren't round. Um, we've just taken a bunch of pictures of round ones, but uh, it is sand experiments, Bob with a cat face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a cat faced Bob Ross. I like it. Cookies. I will figure that one out when I see the other valve, the the uh, internal view, or the Rafi valve. I mean, internal view won't help. Uh, that's another piece of a Mastigloia. I wish we had some nice, flat, internal views of Mastigloia for you. Here's our little, full of junk. Our little Diplonies we saw. It was a nice internal view, but except for the junk. what else we can find. There's so much to explore in these samples. There's so many different types of diatoms here that uh, it's 
going to be a couple of weeks looking at these probably, but I'll at least have a few pictures for Nicole, and then uh, I'll feel like I've made some progress. I think this is Mastogloia, and it looks like a whole valve. Yep. It's a pretty one. broken right there at the end and I think there was I saw another one like right here is that also broken what's up with the broken parts right at the ends I want perfection uh there's a little halomphora I don't know if I'll get a better view of one of those just with the valve so I'm just gonna take this picture while we have it This is like uh, Coffeeiformis or something in that group. Don't know exactly, but it's Halimphora. Looks good. We'll keep. Let's see. <laughs> That's an excellent emote. You might have asked just about what drew you to diatoms in the first place. Um, I uh, I was trained as a geologist, and so I did my master's work in looking at. Uh, not diatoms, but other organisms that lived in the ocean in what are called back reef environments. So the reef, and then the ocean is that way, and then there's this area behind the reef. And in the Permian, there were a lot of these environments that were really shallow, that were behind the reefs. And so I looked at a bunch of material from behind uh, an old reef structure from the Permian uh, San Andres Basin in New Mexico. That's where I did my, my master's work. And the only comparable types of environments today are really like um, the Florida Everglades, the Florida Keys, and the area that's between them is really the only kind of comparable environment to the one that I was studying in the Permian. So when I finished my master's degree, I went to work for the USGS and I was looking at um, micromollusks um, that lived in that back reef environment and one of the other scientists that were working on the project that was working on the project with us uh, was looking at diatoms and so she was showing me them and I was like oh these look really cool and they're found in not just the marine realm but also in rivers and in lakes and so um, so I was interested in getting my PhD and I wanted to study something that didn't just occur in marine environments but was a good tool we could use in terrestrial environments for reconstructing climate change and human impacts on the environment and that sort of thing because um, that was my real interest and so I was looking at diatoms as a potential tool. Um, there's a bunch of other tools you can use. Um, the most frequent ones in, in lake settings today are like ostracods, um, diatoms, pollen, and some people use charcoal, and more recently people have started using things like testate amoeba and some of the green algae, but, um, you know, back in the day, the big three were really just pollen, um, ostracods, and diatoms, and I'd done some work on ostracods when I was an undergrad, uh, just, you know, like I had a guy who studied them, and I thought they were inscrutable <laughs> uh, little jelly beans with tiny little markings on them that uh, that were really difficult for me to figure out um, and so I knew I didn't want to do or probably didn't want to do those and uh, 
and I didn't want to work with pollen because they had a bunch of nasty chemicals you have to use to process pollen. Plus, I think they're kind of generally ugly compared to other organisms in lake settings. And then I ran into diatoms, and I thought, oh, these will work great. It's what I want. It's the kind of tool, useful, broadly applicable, and um, and so that kind of like drew me towards them. And then, ironically, the thing that I like about them, their sort of charismatic appearance and all that, came afterwards. Like I was more drawn to them by the fact that they were extremely useful. Um, or what I wanted to do, which was figure out climate change and and use it to uh, to help understand how humans are in fact in, in affecting environments. So, um, anyways, that's sort of how it happened. I just had a friend who mentioned them to me, and then I started talking with her and uh, got interested in in diatoms as a potential tool, so not the, you know, I didn't know what they were before then, I'd never even heard of them, so I went from not knowing what a diatom was in the year 1996 to becoming an expert in them less than 10 years later. Um, and actually, I could have described diatoms. I found new species of diatoms. They're relatively easy to find new species of diatoms because there's a lot of them. Uh, almost a year into my PhD, I'd already found some and I thought, oh, this is weird. Like I didn't know what a diatom was two years ago and I'm potentially describing new species um, only like two years later. So. Um, but I think once you really start to explore microscopic worlds like diatoms and all the lake organisms, all the marine organisms that are sort of microscopic, I feel like there's an appeal to all of it. Um, they have sort of their own, I just generally became interested in all of it. So, um, but for my research, I have to understand how to interpret their changes in assemblages or groups of them found together. And I have to figure out, like, what do they mean when they're seen in a sample? So I have to kind of explore all kinds of environments and figure out what lives in them, basically. So. Uh, and that's what I do most of the time, is try to figure out what does this diatom mean when we see it? What kind of environment does it prefer? So, um, and then when I have a, a record of them, I can use that to reconstruct climate change um, human impacts and that sort of thing, the things that are actually my primary focus for research. And since I got the SEM, since I wrote a grant and got the SEM funded um, from my university, I've become more of a taxonomist, more of a, um, like a lot more of my research has been focused on describing species and um, characterizing things. So. And I, I think I'm more known for just taking pretty pictures of diatoms right now than anything else. Um, but uh, I still do a lot of research. So I will take the pretty pictures part, though. It's the best part. This is a Mastoglowia. Mastoglowia specialists, um, usually in calcareous environments or environments with a lot of high alkalinity and they live attached to a substrate, so they have a raphe that they use to crawl around. And I think they have a really cool name. Most of the Mastoglowia are marine um, species, but uh, they also live in freshwater environments and they live in these sort of mixed environments where you have high alkalinity, but freshwater or potentially in saltwater environments. So 
pretty commonly. The characteristics for Massaglia that define it, um, the raphe is sort of wiggly, so wiggly raphe, and then they have this internal structure that you can't see because the valves are blocking it out from, for our view. But uh, I'll see if I can find some internal views where you can see the partecta, which is like little subdivisions inside the Mastoglorious skeleton. Um, pretty cool. Okay. Oh, Evalazi's here. Hello, Evalazi. I made a, um, a thing for you. Okay. Uh, did you give Evalazi a shout out? No. I can fix that because I got this one. Evo. See? Told you I would make one. Uh, let's see. I missed questions, so it's, it's taking a picture anyway. Pollen's ugly, yes. And it makes you sneeze. Uh, <laughs> jelly beans with little inscrutable markings. Yes, that's what they are. Little tiny jelly beans. Uh, their skeletons are anyway. It's wild to me that you can tell how humans are affecting the environment from these tiny little guys. You can. There's lots of really cool things that you can tell from diatoms. And in fact, I have a lot of times people will tell me just what diatoms they have, and I can just tell them, oh, you have this kind of environment probably. Just like not ever looking at the diatom, just looking at what they tell me is in the sample. Um, there are tons of geologists where I live, but they all go into it for the money. Yeah, and they specialize. That's a pretty common uh, bit. Are you live in Texas or Oklahoma? That's pretty common for like the southern part of the U.S. Uh, I never thought about diatoms as a tool to fight environmental crises. Um, well, they can be. Paleogeology is a great way to understand the effects of climate on the planet. Yes. Uh, how much do we know about diatom ecology? I mean, pick a diatom. I can probably tell you something about it. Uh, but we know a lot more about to be honest about plankton ecology than we do about benthic species. Um, you know, at the genus level, we have a pretty good understanding of diatoms, but it's, you know, half folklore, I suspect. Um, but it works when we apply it. So, you know, I guess that's all that matters. Um, but I think that the true ecology of diatoms is pretty unknown because there's so many species that, and some of them are so closely related to each other that, um, that they are probably constantly mistaken for each other, uh, for different ones. And so, you know, without an SEM, there's a lot of question marks around it. Um, one of my colleagues, Evelyn Pinsel, uh, is a diatomist, uh, a young diatomist or early career diatomist. I don't know how, not, how young she is. But uh, she found some, something that we would just have called Pinularia borealis a few years ago. Uh, she found something like 30 different crypto species of, <laughs> of that one diatom that she could break out using some canonic, some, some uh, you know, genetic analysis of them. So just to give you some idea, like, we don't have a handle on the species yet, so it's hard for me to say that we have a really good grasp on the ecology, but we understand them well enough that I could say, oh, this is that species. It's usually found in these kinds of environments. Um, you know, I could tell you for sure if I saw something that has a raphe that it almost certainly lived attached to a substrate. So, um, you know, what substrate? Maybe a question mark, but... Um, I don't have any doubt that when I see something that has a raphe that it lived attached. So there's some things that, uh, like if it has an apical pore field or it has a raphe or it has some structure that only occur in diatoms that live in specific kinds of environments. So they can't be mistaken for anything else, um, you know, with respect to their ecology. And so, but the question then becomes like, you know, trying to figure out the fine tune ecology of them is probably poorly known for most species. Um, but it's good enough that I can apply it for a lot of the things that I use it for um, fairly well, in my opinion. So I don't, I don't ever feel like, oh, I saw that diatom and I have no idea what it means. Um, I usually can, it can tell me something. 
This is an interesting looking diatom. It's the same Mastogloia. We see it, we've seen it a bunch. Still haven't seen a nice internal view. But there were some other really cool Mastogloias that were in here. I swear there was like four or five different Mastogloias in the light microscope that I saw. Also, these peanut guys, these peanut shaped diplonies, like sometimes one of the halves are a little bit bigger than the other half, like this one. That side's bigger than this side, and that really freaks me out. Um, you can see it very clearly here, right? Like that side's bigger than that side, and they're not usually asymmetric. So, um, but I think it's just like a circus freak. I don't think that's a, a. I mean, there's a lot of them that are like that, but I think maybe one of them is like that, and they just they all are cloned from the same diatom with a little bit of wonky size ends. So you end up with that. All right, it's almost five. I gotta find at least a couple more pictures uh, to collect here. So sorry if I'm just kind of bouncing in and out of chat, but there's so many diatoms in our field of view in so little time. Um, I will come back here in a second. I'm just going to take a picture of something. i got to find a couple of things to take a picture of first. There's these really long... super long, skinny diatoms that are... That is a gyro sigma, I think. Cool structure on the surface, though. I think it's a gyro sigma and not a pleuro sigma. Little tiny slits. Get one that's not like. Uh, on a pile of junk will be a challenge. Probably for another day. There's another Diplonese. I think that's a different one, but I'm not sure. It has like a tumescent middle part. It's a little chubby, in other words. There's a lot of these uh, Ropolodia in here as well. I suppose they're Epithemia now. Here's one. That's a Mastogloia. It's a different species than the one we saw before. At least I think it's a Mastogloia. beam intensity 6 so we get nice clean sharp edges I probably have to image a bunch of these and compare them with uh, some reference material to try to figure out what it is. To species, but genus is Mastogloria. Okay. What was that face about? 
how do you find diatoms that are in the wrong environment? Uh, I don't know what you mean, but we sometimes will find diatoms that are um, out of place. Like that's a marine diatom in a freshwater system. So that's an example, I guess. Uh, there wouldn't be very many of them if that were the case, though. I mean, occasionally you find stuff in a wrong environment or not preferable environment, yeah. Knives nine have been lurking, but hello, hello. Nipple glue, right. <laughs> All diatoms are welcome here, except for Nitzia. We don't like Nitzia. Well, in the SEM they're okay. Uh let's see, where are we? Oh, okay. Alberta, right. The Canada of Texas. Or Texas of Canada, right. Mustachioed on this guy? Uh, we can do it. Let's see. Um, maybe 45 degrees? Oh, the other 45 degrees. There we go. We'll put him in here. Like this? Is this what you wanted, Astro Canuck? Is a mustache? We have mustaches. It looks fancy now. Wouldn't you agree? Okay. Are there any diatoms that output anything other than oxygen? No. Uh, they're photosynthetic, so they pull in... Well, that's not totally true. They all put out carbon dioxide when they're respiring, so um, when they grow the food, they take in... Uh, carbon dioxide and then when they uh, when they use the food they respire and they give off carbon dioxide just like trees and everything else so um, thanks for giving Astro Canuck a shout out can we do experiments with mixed cultures of diatoms maybe um so many of them look like delicious pastas or cereals. Yes, or candy. Uh, some of them look like candy. There are some that don't photosynthesize, also true. Uh, they eat sunlight. Uh, the ones that don't photosynthesize, they, uh, they eat um, detritus usually, I think. So like carbon junk. Um, top hat goes on the smaller half. I don't have the uh, top hat. I have one with like an, a monocle, but it's on my other uh, OBS. So I feel like that's a good mustache though. Looks good on there. Um, what's the material they get embedded in? So for this uh, SEM, they're not embedded in anything. These are free range diatoms that are just uh, stuck on the surface. Um, but they are coated with gold, like with a sputter coater. And in the light microscope, they are embedded in something called nafrax. Um, but you can also use hyrax and zrax, and that they're basically just a um, a uh, kind of like airplane glue sort of thing that they get glued into the samples on. Um, they're, it's designed so that you could re reattach or reposition the cover slip if it breaks off, but it's hard mounted on the surface of the, um, Nothing the is slide impossible. Not if in you such can a way it. that, um, the refractive index is higher, um, so that the diatoms stand out, so they're more clear or more obvious. A Mastogloia and a Diplonis, which are the two that we've really been sort of focusing on here in this set, because it's most of what we see in the sample. These little peanut-shaped guys are all Diplonis, 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that I haven't even stopped to look at. Because I've been trying to find like an internal view of one of these that doesn't have junk on it. This one still has a little bit of junk on it, but maybe we'll have to do for now. Just so that we have an image of what the internal structure looks like. ecology experiments where you can track rapid adaptive responses. Oh, the neo-ecological experiments that people do, usually we do them in a pond uh, or lake where we have control over the settings because it's kind of hard to culture diatoms uh, and oftentimes when you culture them they they get weird. Um, but uh, you can do cultured experiment where you change the parameters and people have done that for many of this sort of common species. But as I mentioned, it's most common for plankton, less common for the benthic species. So we kind of have a sense of some of them. But uh, yeah, in those uh, webinar series called uh, the um, Diatom Web Academies are really great. And I've given one of those and was been involved in two or three others as a guest sort of component. Um, Does my diatom, does my SEM have an FIB? What is an FIB? I have a, a EDAX for environment, for elemental analysis. I don't know what an FIB is. Focused out. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I can't cut. Uh, I can't cut things in my SEM. I don't need need to do that. Um, I know they make those, um, and I also don't need to like corrode the structure of things to get gases off of them. That sort of thing. I don't do any of that sort of. I'm, I'm just looking at them for their uh, topography for the most part. So. <laughs> A pair of glasses with closed eyes. <laughs> uh, does it also need a mustache? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Like if we put a mustache right here, then it, then it would be good. Like this. Um, it, that looks like it's making a very sad face. <laughs> but the mustache fits perfectly on there, so... Uh, this is a diplonese. I don't know. It's got a contracted middle part, so... Uh, but we're just been calling it diplonese hourglass. This is the internal view. Yeah, that's a Nitsia at, up here, and this is an epithemia down here. Um, some very cool diatoms on all sides of it, actually. Um, let's see if we zoom out and get away from all this craziness, if there's some diatoms that are a little bit more... isolated and exposed. That's the one I was looking for before. Should have taken this picture. Should have did that last time. I'll just take this one. It'll be okay. Ignore the fact that we already have one that's just like this. Uh, 
48. Oops, the diatom disappeared. Oh, it's still here. Come back. Mm, should have been with 43, I think. Pretty good. All right, let's zoom in and take a little close look at the Rafi here so I can get it into focus. Turn off this beam intensity, six. Zoom. Now we have two pictures like this. It'll be good. Okay. Uh, and this one also looks like it's got its eyes closed, so. Take two, they're small, yeah. SEM imaging is so much fun. I'm glad your channel showed up in my recommended feed. Well, I'm glad you decided to join us here, Chippy Flip. Um, I feel like uh, this is, I've been almost doing this for a year now um, from the SEM on Twitch. And um, we've seen a lot of great stuff, not just diatoms, but uh, you know, mostly diatoms. The good stuff has been diatoms. Uh, but um, it's uh, it's nice to be able to share my actual research with people while I'm doing it, and I think uh, fun for me to show people a scanning electron microscope because most people never see anything like this. You know, they might see the pictures if they Google something. Um, they definitely don't see the actual like collection process um, and I feel like there's a lot that uh, a lot of really small structure little tiny things that uh, the SEM really contributes to I don't know making nature look important or look interesting so This needs to be rotated. Right to there. And then I also think if we put a mustache on this one, it would look good. Like right there. Look at that mustache. I feel like the mustache adding component is really Nothing is impossible. A critical part. Not if you can imagine it. <laughs> Thank you for the volume. <laughs> Salty vault. Salty's vault. Uh just that's a perfect mustache right there we got the sleepy eyes we got the glasses and then like a poopy face and a mustache I just learned that UC Davis sells old lab equipment and you're gonna go there soon that's a good idea they probably have old microscopes that are better than the one that you have Dell um, that's probably a good um, they might, you might be able to get a really nice microscope for relatively cheap. So let's actually, let's see, I want to, I'll hit OK on this one and take a picture, internal two, put a name on it, and then I'm going to zoom out a little. There we go. We got the whole picture in the field of view, and now when I put the mustache on, it's not going anywhere. I just got to resize it a little. There we go. Yeah? I feel like that's a winner. 
That's a good mustache right there. That's a that's a quality mustache ad. You have to scale the mustache. Yeah, you don't want to have an inappropriately large mustache for your face. Um, it's important that you make the mustache look just right. Uh, this is very similar to Dell's mustache, by the way. His doesn't curl quite so much on the edges. You need to have some wax for... You need to wax that thing in order to get the curls, the French curls. Scientist for the people. Yeah, that's what I hope. Um, but some people like it. I got to use SEMs in grad school. Yeah, I mean, that's basically where people get to see them and then you don't get to access to them any other time, so... Um, but my lab have I have my own lab with my own SEM, so and uh, this is my outreach to the people. So, there's a YouTuber who managed to buy a secondhand one from the '70s that a university was selling off. Well, uh, earlier, um, yeah, I think um, Nid was in here. I don't know if Nid is still in here, but they have bought a used SEM and uh, an old one. And uh, I think they got it running. They just haven't done a lot of streams from it. They've been streaming mostly from the light microscope, but they're super busy right now. So, um, the air pump is noisy. <laughs> eh, you might be able to get away with it in your basement. I don't know. Um, nice placement, yeah. It's a, a little bit uh, expensive. It's not actually that expensive. The filaments cost about $60 for about 300 hours worth of use. It's the sputter coater that's the expensive part. That's another $10,000. So you could put stuff in there that's metal, though, and then you wouldn't have to sputter coat it. Or just stuff that's conductive, um, which diatoms aren't. So, uh... <laughs> I should have... It should have an official use for identifying its x-axis. That's a good, uh, that's a good idea. Uh, you'll add some wax, it'll do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, let's see. Take up your whole apartment. Your cats would be all over it. The cat hair would get inside of it. Exactly. That's why I have a nitrogen tank hooked up to mine, so it doesn't pull any air in from the room if I can help it. A uh, little desktop SEM that YouTuber streamer Strange Parts featured is pretty neat. I think that Strange Parts guy might actually be on uh, on Twitch too. Um, you can buy a brand new desktop one for like sixty thousand ish, yeah. Um, but they don't have as nice resolution as this instrument. Um, but they still can take pretty nice pictures, and they're a little more rugged than these are, which means that you can usually mount stuff without sputter coating it and um you know they have a value for sure so all right it's a little after five i was only planning on streaming until about five today so uh i'm gonna find a person to raid and then we will go raid them um and we'll see what's going on in my people i follow see if there's anybody out there that we can raid or if people have suggestions, I'll also take those. So, um, yeah, thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm, you know, I when I get home, I've got some other work I need to actually do, and then I gotta gussy up these pictures I just took and post them to Instagram so people can have something to look at. Maybe I'll do one and I'll actually put a mustache on it here for you. Uh, so you can have the uh, poopy-faced, sleepy guy uh, here. Uh, I will stream again from the SEM on Monday uh, next week and then Wednesday next week. So if you're looking for SEM streams, I also stream from my light microscope randomly in the evenings when I feel like it. And uh, there's supposed to be storms all week, so I may stream from my actual camera uh, and do some night photography, thunderstorm stuff. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I should make an emote out of it, yeah. A sleepy guy emote for for Twitch. Maybe I will. That'd be good. That's a good one. Uh, it will look good on Twitch, actually. So I might tinker with it. Uh, if nothing, I could put it into the, uh, the 
BTTV emotes so that people could use it. That would be good. And uh, I can send it, use it for my Discord emotes and send it to uh, Hannah Rebecca for her uh, Diatoms Attack song that she plays. So if you haven't checked that out, you should check it out. And um, I guess if nobody has any suggestions, I'm just going to pick somebody that's in my list of people here to raid. And we'll go say hi to them. Um, let's go to this guy uh, that does the harp stuff. We've raided... We've raided him before. What is this commercial that they play? Uh, you don't have any sciencey suggestions yet. Yeah, me neither. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the harpy guy, uh, Yoshi, whatever his name is. Um, we'll give him a raid, because I like to raid musicians um, and artists as well as scientists. So I feel like uh, there's a little bit of artsiness that goes on in my stream and uh we'll take a look at uh at yoshi he's probably practicing he does a lot of practicing his harp on twitch he's a great musician and we'll we'll uh we'll rate a music that's what we do sometimes here is uh rate art or we rate a music um i like music and i like art so you know Sometimes we also rate a science, but none of my science friends are on right now that I know of, uh, except for maybe Rams Reef is usually running somewhere in the background always. Okay, uh, well, we'll be back next time. I don't know when it'll be, but at the minimum Monday. Um, uh, you should also check out Pacific Plankton stream. She'll be streaming on Thursday, which is tomorrow, um, at the... Uh, midnight-ish Eastern time. And um, you can see some of the stuff that we saw earlier in the stream from the scan electron microscope on her light microscope. Uh, still living around. May start late, okay. Well, uh, until then, we'll see everybody next time and uh, enjoy some harp music. Uh, this guy's amazing, so you'll like Yoshi. <laughs>